Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight for our August version of Hamster Church, uh, sponsored and hosted by Echoes uh, Bellingham, which is a kind of a funky church plant uh, here in Bellingham. We tend to be a place where those who have had a hard time finding a church in which to fit, that they have found a home here. And we are um, an inclusive community that tries to see church in larger ways than just a Sunday morning expression of worship. So we have a creative church, we have hamster church, which is a conversation with someone typically locally about who they are, what they do in the, in the community and a hopes to de-otherize people. Uh, we do have uh, kind of somewhat typical worship once a month. We have wild church, which is church with the wild outdoors every month. We have service church in which we're partnering with uh, local agencies to bring some good into the wider community of Bellingham. Um, and we also have pub church, which Emma oversees. Emma is uh, the co-pastor of, of Echoes and uh, Emma's gonna join us tonight and uh, she'll be fielding some questions and joining in the dialogue tonight as well. And our guest for this month is uh, Deanna Wildermuth. And Deanna, I've, I've known for a few years, I had the honor of being able to preside over her uh, son's wedding uh, here in Bellingham, which is really cool. Deanna has been a, a lot of different things. Um, I have known <laughs> Deanna as a pastor and she has been a, a pastor, a Lutheran pastor in the ELCA denomination uh, in small churches and as head of staff and one of the largest churches in our region. Um, and she recently, it actually your one year anniversary is coming up soon. Mm -hmm. um, about a year ago, uh, decided to switch directions a little bit and um, take her pastoring to be an executive director at the Interfaith Coalition of Whatcom County. Um, so uh, we have an opportunity to hear from her tonight, learn a little bit about who she is and about the Interfaith Coalition. And if you're joining us with, with us live, thank you. Um, and you are welcome to ask any questions in the chat box and we can field those as we go. We will have a QA and a time at the end um, if people still have questions stored up. Um, and it's, it's great to be um, kind of a, an integrated community in our own places, wherever we are today. So we may be uh, in Bellingham, we may be in Washington, we may be really, really elsewhere. Um, and wherever you are, welcome. I guess I should say who I am. My name is Sharis. <laughs> I started Echoes a number of years ago and Hampshire Church is one of my favorite things about Echoes. We, on, in the past, we've had a panel of, of Muslim women. We've had someone who suffered from a very significant um, brain injury. We have had um, a shaman. Uh, we've had uh, uh, Bellingham's uh, iconic drag queen, Betty Desire on here. Um, so we've, we've had just some really, really fun. And we even had someone who uh, sat on the jury of the second Rodney King trial. Um, so all kinds of interesting folks. And so Deanna, you're adding, you're adding to uh, the repertoire of, of fascinating people that we've had a chance to have here. Uh, and it's been it's been live since we've been with COVID, which actually turns out to be an okay platform. So you are here in Bellingham, I take it, in your own home? I am. Great. So we like to start out with um, basically the question, what's the most interesting thing that you've done in this area in the recent past? And maybe it doesn't have to be most, it can be something that was actually really interesting. I don't wanna have to place the pressure oh. to come up with the thing. Well, I know, and now what I was going to say doesn't even seem interesting in the least. <laughs> <laughs> it might be to you. It's okay, and it's okay if it's to you and not anybody else. I know. Well, we went to the, we went to the fair um, in London. I'm a, I'm a fair goer. Uh, I grew up in Sumner, down by Puyallup, down by Tacoma, and the Western Washington State Fairs in Puyallup. And I've been probably over fifty times. Whoa. I go I go like every year. Even when I didn't wow. live here, if we tried to maybe plan a trip. Um, so the Linden Fair, whatever fair that is, I don't even know, Northwest Washington Fair, um, was like a little mini, it's like a little mini fair. Um, 
which was very enjoyable, but we missed the draft horse race. Oh. And so yeah. that was that was sad. We saw them going back into the barn, but that wasn't really what I was gonna share. Um, <laughs> something that I've done just very recently in the last couple of weeks was, had nothing really to do with Bellingham, but it occurred in Bellingham. And that was um, my, my partner, my spouse, um, heard about a new game called Wingspan. And it is very, very enjoyable and unusual. It's what's called an engine game. I, you know, you place cards, it's got beautiful art of birds and you place eggs and put them in habitats and do all this stuff, which sounds a little bit dull, but it was really fun. And on Saturday night, we were at our son's home here in Bellingham and we have a 19 year old grandson and he happened to come in as we were just getting started playing and he joined us and had so much fun because he's played all these other kind of engine games and anyway. It was great and it look it up wingspan it's beautiful and it was designed by a woman the the art was by a woman it was produced that three women were responsible for the game and it's i cannot recommend it enough emma have you heard of it emma does uh has has a game repertoire wingspan i'll um, find a link and post it thank you for sharing that <laughs> <laughs> is it is it about birds airplanes yeah it's birds. birds. Okay. So, and you can learn helpful fact, or not at all helpful. You can learn interesting <laughs> facts about birds. Cool. Cool. Yeah. We we should check it out. We occasionally have a games night with Echoes. We had one just actually this month, last month. Anyway, recently. Yeah. So, and you can play by yourself. It ha and has some this this what? It, set it up so you can play it by yourself because you play against like a, a set of cards. Interesting. It's very interesting, and then up to Everyone? five. Okay. Cool. That sounds great. Anyway, Definitely yeah. should try that sometime. <laughs> so you're in Bellingham uh, and your son and family uh, live here. What is your connection with Bellingham? You know, at, at, do you have a longer connection with Bellingham? You've been here for the past year, but. Yeah, a year on Wednesday. Day? September 1st was my first day. Um, no, I first came to Bellingham exit 252 in the middle of September. 1977, as I drove up to Western, which at that time was Western Washington State College. Um, it, it became university at some point following 77. Um, went to Higginson, which at that time was a co-ed dorm of alternating suites. Wow. And that's where my first, I lived there my first year. And next door to me lived the, the man who would become my husband. So we met in 77 and um, he, he was my first boyfriend. Wow. Yeah. And we got you married, married a week. First, you, you married your first boyfriend. Yeah. No shopping around for you. No shopping around. I had yeah. friends. I had friends who were boys, mm -hmm. but not a boyfriend. We were, we were, I was part of a group in high school, I guess. There was like six or eight of us that just kind of hung out together. Wow. And it was, it was great, great, great fun. Um, and so we, we went to Western, graduated. I changed my major about 43 times. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's not even an exaggeration. And as I realized that Keith was going to graduate within the four years, and if I didn't get my shit together, I was not going to graduate in four years. I, I took a summer quarter of 25 credits and then I did a self-designed major. <laughs> and I took all of my classes that I had taken and, and kind of spread them out and said, well, what could this be? Mm -hmm. And um, it was under a program called Family and Community Service. And I emphasized geriatrics and early childhood education with a little bit of nutrition thrown in. And I finished in four years. Hey, congrats yeah. with all the- I had, I had to defend it in front of a panel of professors. Wow. You did something that's very hard, graduate in four years from Western. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, but that was back in the day. <laughs> I read a book recently um, that centered a Native American elder. And he says that 
the very young and the very old have um, a ton in like they have the most commonality because they are the closest to the creator having been born and going. And uh, so it's, it makes sense to me that you would actually have both of those in one, one major. So. Yeah. That, that's a wonderful image. Um, was not the image that I had in mind when I did it, but I did find as it, as I went through and, and through my life's work that the, the things I learned about how to work with young children were actually very effective when I worked with elders, not to treat them as children, but techniques of engagement for folks with Alzheimer's hmm. um, is very similar to what you might do with a, with a toddler or a preschooler. And again, not to treat them like children, right, right. But, but just the way in which you engage and, and just some stuff. So I found lots of stuff. And certainly as I became a pastor in a lot of communities of faith, you have a, a the breadth of life, Yeah, you know, from, from the newly newly living to those who have lived long. Great, cool. All right. Well, um, so Bellingham has been uh, in in your life and in your heart since a very young age. So, correct. Is this the like when you graduated? Did you leave or? Oh yeah, we yeah. left first. Well, we both grad. We graduated and got married a week after graduation. So I don't necessarily recommend it, but that's what we did. Um, and neither one of us had work. And my husband was a math computer science major with a physics minor. And um, we ended up living at his parents' home in Kent. And luckily it was a brief time because then he got work at McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis, Missouri. So we moved to St. Louis. Typically, folks uh, with that major can end up with some work. <laughs> yeah, he was a scientist. So he was a scientific programmer, not a um, Microsoft kind of programmer. Okay. So, yeah. Right. So St. Louis for a couple of years, and we were in Portland, Oregon for seven, or outside of Portland for seven years, and then up in Seattle for a few years. Then I felt called to ministry. Cool. And you've been doing things before then. Um, yeah. One more question about Bellingham, since we're so Bellingham mm -hmm. based. What's one of your favorite things about Bellingham? I mean, you're back now. So like, what were mm -hmm. you excited to be back for? Um, I love, I love, I love, I love the, the bay, the water, the water. Um, and the, like Boulevard Park wasn't around at the time. Um, but I just, I like the proximity to to water and i will say you know i mean it has a special place in my heart but i love campus and yeah. even though it's not the same now i just i i love sea home hill and you know kind of walking around up there and walking through campus um and coming we most recently lived in seattle and so <laughs> coming up back up here it's like oh we can go almost anywhere in 15 minutes mm -hmm. That's pretty, yeah. that's pretty and, great. <laughs> and stay in Bellingham. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, nice to have a little bit of introduction and uh, a little bit of, of your history. There's a lot more history than that. So maybe that'll come up as, <laughs> as we chat. Um, but you, you left um, church pastoring to do ministry with the Interfaith Coalition. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know about the Interfaith Coalition. Can you give us um, some broad brushstrokes of of this organization? What 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 does your organization do? Interfaith Coalition is um, a nonprofit that um, right now works on providing emergency shelter and transitional housing for I like to say children and their families, whomever those children mm -hmm. would identify as family. Um, those who are um, not stably sheltered or who are experiencing homelessness. And we, we fill a unique kind of position in that role because there's other, there's other organizations in town that provide housing for children and their families. Um, one of the things that we do that is a little different is we, we have a broader definition of what it means to be homeless. So we use what, what would be called the McKinney-Vento definition, which is a, the school liaisons, that's a, um, a bill and identification for um, 
identifying children who are experiencing homelessness and they have a, a school advocate, a liaison to help navigate when families are in that situation. And to be considered without a home under the McKinney-Vento Act is to, is you are considered homeless even if you are couch surfing or if you are doubled up as a family. Uh, and so a lot of shelters won't take you into shelter unless you have literally been homeless for at least one night. So living on the street, living in a tent, living in your car um, qualifies as being literally homeless. And you have to do that for at least one night before you would qualify to get into shelter. We, we don't do that. We will also um, house folks that are um, defined as Alice families, asset limited, income constrained, employed. Um, so the working poor. And we can we can give folks a pause. We ha we have what's what's called a bridge program where they can they can have a, a stable place to live while they are able to you know save up money for deposits or or rent or get employment things figured out. Maybe maybe one adult in the household is working and the other one's not, or maybe there's issues with the kids and they're just not able to kind of get their feet under them. Um, so, so we do that. We also house multi-generation family, generation, generational families. Um, we currently have one household that has a father and his two adult children, two adult daughters, and each of those daughters has a child. So there's five in the household and it's three generations. Um, and, and that is, that is okay with us. Um, so housing. No. How, yeah. Th those folks would be impossible to put into a shelter. Right. And be together. Yeah. Right. That and that right. And that actually that's another really good point. Some shelters, when boys reach a certain age, they can no longer be housed with their sister or you know, that sort of thing. So like gender stuff and certainly like in a three generational, they would not be able to be in the same location. Wow. So it sounds mm -hmm. um complex in that you've given us uh two kind of standards by which you have um you consider folks who are homeless and and then another, the ALICE acronym for um, the working poor. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it, if, if one was not in a home, that things could be super complicated for figuring out how to actually get housed in some sort of way, whether it's transitional or shelter mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. I mean, how do you, I mean, someone who has to like navigate this system, particularly if they're new to it and they don't know what, you know, they haven't experienced it. It sounds like it could be hard. It's really hard. I will say a year ago, I could not have said anything that I just said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know anything about um, housing and shelter for folks. And so that's been a, a steep hill. But one thing that um, I discovered really, really quickly is that any sort of stereotype that I had about the um, the intelligence or the um, energy, the the impetus, the drive for folks, you know, where you might see somebody that's living in a tent or or whatever, and, and be thinking, well, why don't they do something? Why don't they do something? The fact that it's so challenging and that people figure it out is amazing. It's amazing, and it's an it's a challenge for any provider um, of any sort. For the Opportunity Council, uh, you know, the Department of Health here in town, for folks at Lydia Place or Mercy Housing or Northwest Youth Services, all of us deal, you know, with with this population in different ways with these people, and and the fact that folks can even navigate it is astonishing, even to find a, a first place you know, to, to go to the Opportunity Council website and it says, you know, do do you have a place to live kind of thing. It's like, and if my answer is no, I could click something. But of course you might be just, you know, doing it on your phone, on a little tiny screen or at the library, um, which just reopened. You know, it's like, I, it's astonishing to me. Um, and it's why we have, like we have a case manager that helps our families navigate. Opportunity Council, same thing. Lydia Place, same thing. 
Northwest Youth Services, same thing. Somebody to accompany you because it's a lot. Yeah. Do you um, do you exclusively work with families? We do. Yeah, there has to be a child 18 or younger um, involved. Although we we do make some exceptions um, if the if the child is still so they can be older if they're still in school. Um, sometimes that happens, or if there's um, if there's a developmental need that um, precludes that child, you know, being out on their own kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. So that's a hard one when we get phone calls when people don't have children because then we have to say no. Yeah. And we offer other referrals, but. Okay. Are, are you working collaboratively with those other entities that you mentioned? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Bellingham and Whatcom County, I, I mean, I think it's true in most areas, but I'll just say we do it better than anybody um, of working, you know, having working partnerships and, and mutual respect and, and understanding that that somebody else might know the answer to the question that we have or have, have done it before and saying, you know, they'll reach out. Um, but we work a lot um, together. We've had, we've had um, tenants in some of our properties who, you know, come through Lydia Place. So they're case managed by Lydia Place case managers, but they're going to be housed in our housing because we had the space, um, you know, and the, the opportunity for them to um, get situated and, and on to the next thing. Um, we work really closely with DV SAS as well. Mm -hmm. So we can take direct, we do take direct referrals from DV SAS. Um, okay. And DV SAS, for those who don't know. Domestic violence, sexual assault. assault. Yeah. It services. I know I shouldn't yeah. use, I, I, I keep, for the last year, I take notes like in meetings of acronyms. And then when the meeting's done or during the meeting, depending on if I have two screens going, I put the acronym into the search bar so I know what people are talking about. <laughs> yeah. How I've got all kinds of questions about about the, the work at Interfaith. I, I just how has it been moving from being a pastor to being an executive director of, of this organization? Like what how's it been for you? Um, mostly good because the the hardest part was I literally knew nothing about this work when I started. Um, however, I had experience in the position or the work of the position. So I could learn, I could learn the things about sheltering families and, and programmatic things. I could learn that pretty easily, but working with the staff or, you know, dealing with a budget or talking about um, assessing programs or that sort of thing. That's kind of the same in a church. The hardest part was really coming into something that I didn't know, even though I've been in different churches and churches do things differently, there was a frame that was familiar. And so that made, that makes it easier here. There was no frame um, that was familiar. But yeah. I have a great staff. So this, cool. a great staff makes it much easier. Awesome. I and a follow up question and that actually comes from somebody is, I mean, if you're kind of on you know on a path in your in your career and in your life, like to make a change like that can be pretty drastic. Um, why did you choose to make that change? Is our question a question that has risen? <laughs> yeah, sometimes I ask myself. Um, <laughs> if, <laughs> like anything, I would say. Um, I think for many of us and for me, it happened a few years ago where I felt a little um, at odds with the work that I was doing. Like, was it the right place, the right situation, the right people, um, whatever. And it, and it was starting to feel less right. Um, I wasn't unhappy and the church was doing well. There wasn't any conflict or budget crisis or anything like that, but I was feeling unsettled, I guess is maybe a good way to put it. And so I started, um, as a person of faith, I prayed about it and talked to my spouse about it and, and all of that sort of thing, but started looking at other possibilities. 
um, not necessarily wanting to leave the church or work that had a kind of a compelling purpose behind it. Um, but what else could I do? I've been a pastor almost 25 years. And even though I've done a lot of things in my life, that's a huge piece of my work life. And so what am I qualified for? Um, and so some of these other things didn't work out. And then a day I was just really, 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 really cranky and ready to just, that's it, I was done. But we're not independently wealthy and I needed to be working. And so I was on Craigslist and I thought, you know, we always wanted to live back in Bellingham sometimes. So I'm going to check what's in Bellingham. And there was a position at Opportunity Council and I thought I could do this job. I mean, I'm just, I was just pissed. And so I told my husband and he said, well, if you want to apply, apply, it, you know, whatever. Um, very supportive. And um, so I went back up to the computer and I was going to pull up the stuff to make the, to complete the application and I couldn't find it. And then I, the application or the notice, the job posting was on Craigslist for the executive director at Interfaith. And when I read through it, I thought, oh, I can do this job. <laughs> and so I didn't even go back downstairs. I just pulled up all the stuff and completed what I could right then, but got all the information I needed um, to submit the application. So, um, and my resume and oh, all, all of that. <laughs> and did screening, you know, screening interviews and and uh, Zoom interviews and then in-person interviews and um, I don't recommend starting a new job in a new area during a pandemic. I don't recommend it. I have not yet had the entire staff in the same place at the same time in person one year. And I've not yet had the entire board in the same place at the same time in person. That's, an, that's a curious way to work. And it's not a good way to develop um, or it's much more challenging to develop relationships. And with board relationships, I think it's much harder to deliver or to develop um, relationships of trust. Not that they distrust me. It's just a different dynamic when all you have is the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, everybody. Take that as a pro tip. <laughs> yeah. Next global pandemic. Don't, don't be I looking don't. at that kind of change. Mm -mm. <laughs> And yet, and yet, you know, um, we do have a son and his family here, um, three grandsons. And, you know, the little guys are five and seven. They've spent the night with us multiple times. They like to come hang out with grandma and grandpa. So that was a good bonus. Very good bonus. <laughs> and we're in beautiful Bellingham. Yeah, close to the bay. Exactly. I know. We get Salish <laughs> seawater right here. Mm -hmm. For sure. So um, what is the um, kind of situation for families who are experiencing homelessness here in Bellingham? You've got uh, how many how many places can you house people? Because I know you've got individual units in different places in the yeah. county. Like how, how many how many units do you have and what kind of demand is there for your mm -hmm. services? We have eight apartments that we own, that we built or we built, we created, remodeled, whatever. So we have eight. Um, three of those are in Ferndale and five of them are here in Bellingham. And then we have three homes, um, one in Ferndale, one in Ferndale and two in Bellingham um, that are well, the city of the one in Ferndale is actually a city of owned by the city, and we lease it for. We did have two, and now we have one because of maintenance issues. But um, they are homes that are will be demolished when a traffic plan that is already established is done, which just depends on fiscal stuff with the city of Ferndale. Until that time, we get this house for a very low price. Um, and it's one of our transitional homes. It has a family there now. And then um, two others are, um, we have master lease um, with them through churches. So whether it be in a previous parsonage, you know, where they house their pastor or something like that, or, or we've had churches purchase property and um, 
for the sole intent of having a ministry or a mission or an intent of providing housing. And so right now we have 11 total housing units, um, which four of them right now are emergency shelters, one's a bridge home, and the other six are transitional. Can you describe the difference between those? Emergency shelters are um, up to 90 days, 30, 60, 90 in our program. And those are, those are part of our Family Promise program. And so they have really intensive um, holistic case management that is tied to those. And um, at, they were meeting with the case manager regularly and 30 days assessment kind of thing. Are you ready to go, not go? Nope, okay, stay longer, 60, 90 days. With the pandemic, we've had families stay longer than 90 days. Um, not every family, because it just all depends. Um, transitional housing is generally for up to two years and tends to be under subsidies. Um, so the families are placed or identified through Opportunity Council or another agency in town. And then um, they are case managed through Opportunity Council, not as intensively, but it, they, the families pay 30% of the rent and then the subsidy pays the balance of that. Um, and we are developing now programs through Family Promise, which will be open to all of our housing guests through any of our properties. So we have a tutoring program um, for kids that we started last fall that we, we intentionally did it because during the pandemic, if your family had resources, you could hire somebody to come in and do Zoom school with your kids, or you could form a little pod and have you know the five neighborhood kids have a, a tutor person um, because you had the resources to do that. Our families don't have the resources to do that. And their kids, in some instances, were trying to do school on phones. You know, they'd get a device from the school and be able to do that. That's great. But they had no additional support. So we now have a tutoring program that we do for those kids. Um, and then bridge program is kind of an in-between thing. And it's something we, we offer for folks who um, are transitioning out of emergency shelter but they're not quite there yet to find their own place, often because they don't have a rental history. And mm -hmm. so the bridge housing is for at least a year, um, probably no longer than two, but if we can give them a solid 12 months of paying rent, then they have that as history. And it's easier for them to get in to their own stable housing. And we, with the bridge program, we also incorporate uh, a savings program in which we set aside a portion of the rent that then is returned to them when they are ready to move to move out. Um, we also provide support through vouchers to Habitat, um, the Habitat store. I was going to say Habitat for Humanity, but not that. The Habitat store. So if folks need furnishings or that, they can when they move into their permanent housing, they can they can do that. So 30, 60, 90 days, one year or two years okay. is kind of a pattern. Those 11 properties that you have, it just kind of rotates who's what. You don't have like, okay, this one is just an emergency one. We have two. Two. Yeah, good question. We, we have two that are only emergency. Okay. And that's, they're tied to special funding. Okay. And and that, that really... Um, we, we had to make a switch. Family Promise began three years ago, and it was emergen an emergency shelter model that rotated among different churches. And so up to five families would stay in a church building, like in a Sunday school room, a classroom, and for a week. And there would be volunteers that would come and do breakfast and dinner. And every Sunday, they moved to a different location. And when COVID hit, we couldn't do that anymore. That was congregate living, and so we couldn't do it. So we had to change up, and and at the time, we only had two families in the emergency shelter, and we had a congregation that said, you can house them here. Hmm. And so we got a mini fridge and microwave, took a took a took the restrooms in the hall and gave one to one family and one to the other family, so they had private restrooms. Um, and then we had what was called the day center, um, which was a house on one of the church properties that had showers and laundry. And so they would not go at the, on the same day and be able to shower or go morning, afternoon kind of thing and be able to shower and do laundry um, during that time. And then the church needed the space back. 
So we had to do that. And then that, that's when we started housing um, more than two um, families in our, in our housing units. Okay. So, so we were fortunate in that regard um, because we, we had this opportunity to house more because I'll just give you a statistic just because in 2020, we're in 21, <laughs> in 2020, there were on the point in time count, which is done in January, um, there were 64 families that were counted as being without a home. In 2021, there were 96. Wow. Yeah. And more than likely, both of those years were an undercount, mm -hmm. and most definitely probably this year. But that's a 50% increase. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so how, how do people get on your list, right? If there if there's that many unhoused families around here, um, mm -hmm. like how do they find you? How do you sort through? How, are those difficult decisions? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. We do some direct referrals, so folks call call directly. Uh, but we also work through coordinated entry um, in the community. It used to be years ago. It used to be that it was like first come first serve when you went through agencies. And, and so, you know, the list was whoever called and you just start at the top of the list and you go down. And so if you're, you know, number 43, it's gonna be a while before they get there. Um, they use a different system now and they interview, folks are interviewed and, and to identify their barriers to housing, you know, what are their challenges? And so now folks are identified as those with the highest barriers. Um, the greatest need um, are, are moved to the top of the list kind of thing. And so when we have a vacancy, we will um, contact Opportunity Council, coordinated entry, and say we have a two bedroom um, unit available. You know, it'll be, it's available right now. And here's, here's how many people could be there um, kind of thing. And then they will look at their list and see who kind of meets the criteria. Family Promise for Emergency Shelter, Family Promise, because it has additional program pieces, also has a secondary intake. And so the, the families that come to stay with us um, agree, they, they're given all of this information if they're referred to us, and they agree to participate and to do these things. Um, some of which we offer um, literacy classes through Whatcom Dream. We partner with them. We offer parenting support through Bridget Collins. We offer um, connections with Unity Care, um, and so people. And it's part of it's part of the program. If you choose to be housed in the emergency shelter through Family Promise, and sometimes families say, "You know what? No, we don't want to do any of that." And then, unfortunately, then they're not a good fit. Yeah. Um, but Opportunity Council usually catches. They know what our that secondary criteria is, and so they're pretty great about. Um, referring families that will that will succeed and be a, be a good fit. The, the deal is now it's really challenging because there's not very high availability of affordable housing. Right. Oh and gosh. so people are having to stay longer because they can't get out. Um, yeah, so. that was one of my questions is how many families are able to actually stay in Bellingham? Because, I mean, I yeah. know when I was doing service, you know, rotating shelters in Seattle, it was like, we were meeting these great families, getting them connected with services, and then they had to leave these places, and then they had to establish all new, you know, social service networks. Mm -hmm. Which, if you have any sort of mental health, uh, any sort of addiction, uh, PTSD, yeah. you know, challenges working with um, people in authority, um, which right. can be challenging when you've, you know, um, potentially been harmed by these by these systems in the past. So I'm just curious if you if you have numbers on how many families are able to stay in. Bellingham, or I'll just even say Whatcom County at this point. Uh, oh, sure we do. Why'd you ask me that question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't have no, when, no when rates. Mean, yeah, they say when yeah. the rates, you know, go up, a, you know, even just ten percent, homelessness increases. And so, right. you know, I'm just, I was right. just curious what what your, you know, rates are. Yeah, and we do have that information, and I don't know them. I mean, I would have to search through my computer, and that would be. Well, just like off the top of your head, are you seeing more people able to stay or is it hard? Well, yeah. Uh, well, it's harder. And yes, they're staying. 
because like anyone, you if you if you've got family connect, some of these folks, a lot of these folks have family connections here, mm -hmm. or they have history in the area. And so they don't want to move to another right. area that is a strange place to them. So so they will tend to linger longer in the shelters that they are in. And and all the different agencies are trying their darndest now to figure out how folks can stay longer, um, you know, making accommodations with um, all the parameters of subsidies or grants or things like that. Um, and and then I think you, it, it's hard to navigate the, the landlords and the property managers, but people want to stay. And if they have kids, which all of our, we only serve children and their families. And so if your kids are already in school, and you've started to get a bit of stability, you don't tend to want to make a shift on that one too. And so I would say it's probably well over 75, 80%, 90% even that are staying locally within the county um, that at least go through our program um, because, because they already have ties to the area. Mm -hmm. It's very few, very few that we get um, into the shelter, into housing that are coming from, traveling from elsewhere, you know, and land in town every once in a while, but not very often. Yeah. I um, just, in the past day or two, stumbled across this uh, YouTube channel of this um, young guy, he's in his 20s, uh, who went to UC Santa Cruz and uh, um, dropped out after his junior year, went back home and just, pined for his college community. I mean, it was just palpable. I mean, the poor guy, um, it, it was fairly dramatic actually how much he missed his community that he had, had developed back in Santa Cruz. And so he ended up converting a van to go back and, and live amongst, mm -hmm. amongst this community. And it's like, that's how important it is to be with folks with yeah. whom you have relationship, right? It's super hard mm -hmm. to go to a new place, particularly when you don't know the services that are there. Yeah. Um, and you don't have anyone else who you can depend on outside of a service. Um, so anyway, yeah, and it if, is. And yeah. And if trauma, I mean, being home without a home is trauma, mm -hmm. you know, pandemic is trauma. Losing your job is trauma. Addiction is trauma. And you know, and you have all of that stuff. And if the, the only bit of safety or consistency is location, you know, I think you are even more apt to hang on to that. Yeah. Something that we're trying to, not trying to do, we are going to be doing because we've just got a big old grant um, to do it is to actually start to work a bit on the upstream side of um, unstable housing. We received what is called a HUMI grant, um, which stands for Help Us Move In. It's a Washington organization. And this provide it was a challenge grant. And so we had to raise $10,000 and I'll say thank you publicly to Peace Health Community Foundation because they are partnering with us on this. Um, and we got $10,000 from Peace Health Community Foundation, which then HUMI matched with $10,000. And then we are challenged to raise another 20, which I did last week. Hi. So it's a, I know, I know it's a, it's a two year, a two year grant. So 40,000 each year. And, and the funding on that is not to fund our current operations at all. We are going to be establishing an opportunity for prevention, diversion, and stabilization. So we can assist people with rent or mortgage payments, um, which isn't Right now, we need to be spending the money that the government has provided for landlord and tenant <laughs> relief, but we can assist with that. We can assist with utilities. We can assist with maybe a car, you know, assist with rent so that you can make the car repair. We can't pay the car repair, but if you do the car repair and you can't pay rent, if we can help you with rent, then you can get the car repaired. Mm. Um, so, so that we can stop people from losing their home. So we can stop people from entering the eviction process so that we can um, help a family remain um, where they're at. Um, because that would be the preferred model <laughs> as yeah. opposed to having folks have to lose their home um, and, and have to you know, navigate all of that stuff 
Yeah. And as you say, said, the, the trauma of that. Yeah. 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 So we're, we're very excited about that. Um, Opportunity Council does this. They do rental assistance in that. And they will say, you know, you call on the first of the month and they will be done with all the all that they can help that that month before midday. Hmm. Because the need is the need is so, so great. So we're excited about this literally just happened. And so we're getting everything in place and we'll be talking to our partners in town too. Um, because what our hope is that we can provide assistance to people who maybe don't qualify for assistance mm -hmm. through other um, prevention programs or that sort of thing. Because that, from the beginning, that was one of interface things. We exist to fill the gaps. Right. So. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, Sherris and I were talking about it earlier, and I, I had mentioned it um, in some recent speaking that Interfaith celebrates 40 years on October 17th, and it began in 1981. And it began in 81 when Reagan was president, um, when he was trying to cut the size of government or was cutting the size of government and a lot of human services were being cut. And medical support was one of those um, victims of government reduction. And a pastor at Christ the Servant here in town, Don Clinton, thought it was a horrible thing and that people of faith should care and that he believed they could make a difference. And so he gathered um, folks, faith leaders, and folks from 44 different communities, plus St. Joseph's Hospital, so Peace Health from the beginning. Um, and they decided that they were going to address healthcare. And they had volunteers taking phone calls and they had doctors saying, I have two appointments on Thursday and one on Wednesday and you know four next Friday or whatever. And people would call in and say, I need to see a doctor for this, I found a lump and they would make an appointment for them and they'd be seen free of charge, all volunteers. Um, and that went on for a bit of time and that interfaith health service is now Unity Care Northwest. So pretty powerful beginnings for interfaith around that. And when when the health service thing expanded or you know exploded bigger um, and better, then the pivot was made to housing. And that's what we've done since then, so from the early 90s. Cool. I'd yeah. love to know, um, and that history is actually really important. I mean, uh, a, a good chunk of Bellinghamsters know about Unity Care. If you don't need it, you don't know about it. But just about anyone who needs it knows about it. Um, and the fact that it got started through such a grassroots effort through church folk, through Lutherans, which actually is kind of cool, um, through Lutherans uh, working collaboratively with others. I mean, when when f people of faith can work together, amazing things can happen. Um, so the fact that unity- and when, there, mm -hmm. and when people of faith can work with non-people of faith, mm -hmm. because there's not, yep. I think early on, there was really a, you know, you needed to be a part of a faith community, you know, whatever to do. Uh, you know what now sure be a part yeah. of a faith community and it doesn't have to be christian i mean that's we've got yeah. non-christian folk that's that's fine um and you don't have to be in a faith community to be involved right um you, you know peace health is one of is one of our partners you know yeah. um it, it, it's just it's an interesting thing and it's an it, it's more expansive now i mean we even changed our bylaws recently to allow greater participation on our board to not limit it only to people who were members of our member congregations. Well done. Or members of our community. You know, it's like, well no, done. we can have. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. Cool. Um, what, what are some, what are some stories from, I mean, obviously no uh, uh, HIPAA violations or anything like that, but um, what are some stories of folks who've come through the program or who are, you know, waiting or, one of my favorites um, was a family that we we have we have a moving company, um, which is called the staff. And when households are <laughs> when households are ready to move into their their stable permanent housing, um, we often are the ones that are helping them move. Um, we we will assist with renting a U-Haul and then load that U-Haul and schlep boxes and things. 
in and out of places. And we were working with a family that had a teenager and a young man, and he was pretty quiet and, and we were just getting things and he was answering questions and we were getting things out of the house and, or out of the apartment and into their new place. And when I walked in with uh, an armful of stuff um, into the new place, he met me and had the biggest smile on his face. Now he's like 13. And I don't think I'd ever seen him smile, but a big smile on his face. And he says, hey, do you want to come and see my room? And I just thought, that's, that's pretty great, mm. you know. And so I dropped my stuff. And, you know, he got to show me his room where he was already putting his stuff um, away on shelves and such. On another one of our moving adventures, um, a seven-year-old maybe, little boy. Um, he was very strong and, and he helped us, um, move, um, the family. Um, he, he was the one who was going to really help us go up three flights of stairs and, and he did, and he did. Um, it, it was, it was great. It was great. Cool. Good. How, um, how are you all funded? We are funded primarily through individual donations and donations from communities of faith, um, business partners in town. I, I would say we are, we are, I don't know what the percentage is, probably 70%, maybe even a little higher, funded literally by the community and folks in the county, um, individuals in that. Very, very little government grants, um, hmm. probably, probably 40,000 or so, That's which isn't very much. Private foundations um, and community foundations, Whatcom Community Fund, um, United Way. We are a United Way partner agency and we love the United Way and the work that they do. Um, and they funded us for three years now, I believe. Um, and we're delighted to be a part of that. Um, a Jerry H. Walton is a small foundation out of Cedro Woolley that has funded us for a number of years. And, and the executive director there actually sent me an email in mid-July and said, Deanna, you guys are eligible, you know. And I'm like, oh, I know, but I thought I missed the, I thought I missed the cutoff. So I was just going to wait till the next quarter because it's quarterly. And she goes, eh, we'll extend it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, I'll get it to you today. That's lovely. Lovely yeah. to have that trust and that um, mm -hmm. to be valued mm -hmm. in that regard. So the work that work that you're doing. Um, what what are some of the challenges? I mean, the Interfaith Coalition. You've got a lot of things going on. You've got a bunch of different staff. You've got eleven different units and all of these um, relationships with other entities in town. And you know the number of of houseless families that are still out there that aren't being served what, what are some of the challenges that that you see that the interfaith coalition faces externally and possibly even internally mm -hmm. i think that um I'll, I'll say funding but because that's an ongoing thing but you know in a way because sometimes you want to choose to make a decision that you think would be the best and you're not able to do it because it will impact. So, so right now, if we were to know, we're trying to decide what do we do with what, what would be the highest and best use of the, the housing that we have? Um, what would, what would serve the people, the tenants, the guests, the families, what would, what would be the best for them? And we have had conversations as a staff, would it be best if we were able to bring families, let's say into emergency shelter, and then be able to um, have stages of housing that we would provide so that they could continue with a strong case management support and kind of a community support. We're, we're trying to connect volunteers with families as mentors so that they can feel like they have somebody we're, we're trying to help create relationships. As we said earlier, like, why do you want to leave a place where you have relationships? Um, and maybe you've burned all your bridges, even though you still want to stay in the area. And so can we provide something? But in order to do that, that means we lose certain things. You know, if we were to, to manage all the housing ourselves without any kind of subsidy support, then that shifts financial stuff. Um, and, and so, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? 
Um, I think it's, I think, I think the complexity of, of support and opportunities and resource, the complexity of accessing that or knowing about it is really tough. And we have a, I would say we do have a great community and I'm in meetings regularly with different agencies and, and I'm on advisory councils and stuff where we talk about funding and, and distribution of grants, you know, block grants from the federal government or the money that's out there now for tenant and landlord relief, um, for rental relief, to, for eviction prevention. Um, Whatcom County received millions and millions and millions of dollars, about 15 million. And we've given away seven. There's $8 million still to be had. And, and people aren't, you know, it's like, how can we help them access that? How can we, how can we do that? Um, and everybody's trying. <laughs> like, um, so, I mean, and that's, that's a big program that, that is complex. I think accessing the money isn't as complex, but getting the information out there is. Um, and how it's hard to give away money. Who knew? Oh, no. um, <laughs> but but then just other programmatic pieces. You know how do you how do you help people understand what's out there that is available? Um, huge challenge, huge huge challenge, and all the parameters around qualifications and things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have uh, someone on YouTube. Ingrid mentioned that she remembers 1981. And uh, uh, that start uh, uh, because she lost an inter internship because of those particular presidential cutbacks. So, yeah, people know those Some things. things. The more they change, the more they stay the same. Mm, yeah, which is a hard word. Yeah, it is. It's. Not, I think often what I've heard from homeless families too is the challenge of proving your homelessness gets really tiring. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, that actually is, um, I think a deep flaw in our system, right? That we, yeah. you, you literally will have to say, did you sleep outside last night? Right. And yes. if they say no, you say, I cannot help you. And I, yes. I find that to be like deeply spiritually and personally troubling that like we have humanly a, troubling, humanly <laughs> troubling. And also that sometimes our services also, you know, asks that we don't make a certain amount of money. Right. Or if mm -hmm. our, that that will then disqualify us. So it feels like a lot of a lot of the challenges, you know, we can give people a lot of information, but if if they don't know the nuance, right, of how to keep qualifying for something, that I think that relationship building that you were talking about is really, really important, you know, so people know those different um those different types of things. So I'm encouraged to hear that there are kind of family, they get matched up with other families because it feels like mm -hmm. if you're only with or connected with other families who are experiencing homelessness that that like I'll just use the word like despair can be mm -hmm. you know can be something or um or just like well I'll just go sleep on my family's couch because it's easier you know like but that like mm -hmm. you were saying that doesn't suddenly make you not homeless that just means you have a place right. to sleep that night but still according to the you know what I mean anyway so yes i i like wonder how you like how you deal with people's um, with some of that missing relationality that I think contributes to homelessness pretty deeply in our, in our country. So how do you, how do you deal with this as an executive director? And then also how do you deal with this when you do have those one-on-one -on -one relationships or when your staff is not able to help someone or mm -hmm. when someone calls and, you know, they're just, they're having a really hard time. So how do you, how do you kind of deal with, that's a big question, but. How do it is a big question. <laughs> how, how do I how do I deal with it poorly, poorly sometimes? And I, I will say that as a pastor person, um, one of the skills I at least developed over time was the ability to listen. And so when I take calls at the office, and I'm the only one that usually is in the office, mm. and so somebody will check messages if I don't answer, kind of thing. But if I'm there, I answer the phone, and so I get calls every week from somebody looking for housing or somebody looking for interfaith health services because <laughs> our number is still out there on that. But um, I listen. I let them tell their story. I, I, I let them tell me what's going on, even if it's somebody we can't help. 
Mm. Um, because too often, I think people in general, but certainly people that are experiencing the crisis of being without a place to stay, to live, um, there's nobody to listen to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on a personal level, for a number of years now, I, I try to, if, if I see somebody, you know, at, at the um, driveway at Fred Meyer, you know, or at a freeway exit, I at least make eye contact. You know, um, I go for walks. If I go for a walk and, I, and I'm on the sidewalk and I'm going by somebody that's got the sign up, um, I say hello and look them in the eye. Um, I, I try not to turn away um, because the dignity of, of being greeted mm -hmm. is, uh, that's a pretty simple thing for me to do. Um, I also have to be really cognizant that if I'm, if I'm going to give somebody, um, you know, a $5 bill, if I'm going to do that, I don't get to choose how they're gonna spend it. I can't, I can't give with the strings attached, mm -hmm. you know? And so if you don't want to give without the strings like that, then, then don't give it, mm. um, you know, do a gift card if you want, do, you know, McDonald's, taco time, what, you know, do you see the family that's asking for diapers, buy diapers, you know, um, but trying to be really mindful of how my attitude, how literally my attitude is. And that's true just in my general life, but that's true in my work as well. And we really work hard on that as a staff, that the ways in which we speak about our families is not, we, we don't, even when it's just among staff, mm. we are respectful and, and treat them with dignity. Um, and then there's those places where you know, the boundaries need to be drawn and stuff and they still have to be drawn, you know? And so that's a hard place because you know that family's, you know, having a hard time. Um, so trying to do that gently and um, appropriately and respectfully, you know, um, that, you know. I think I'd said to somebody early on when, so early on, like a year ago, nine months ago, I said, I don't want to live in a community where it's okay that children don't mm -hmm. have a home. Amen. That's why I think our work's important. I don't want to see the tents anywhere. I don't want anyone of any age to be without adequate shelter. I really don't think it's okay for children to be in that situation. So we'll work to help make that not a reality for the kids. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's helpful. Um, we did have a question uh, about the Bellingham and Whatcom County leadership and councils. Mm -hmm. And are do you, do you feel like they kind of get it in regard to homelessness and the need that's out there? Um, certainly they're, they have their um, detractors. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, that this would this is a this is a Lutheran thing. I'm going to interpret my neighbor's actions in the best possible way. I think they do get it, and I don't think they always know what to do hmm. or what the best way forward might be. And sometimes that may be because um, the leaders, the individuals, haven't thought about it you know, I mean, so then that's a fault, you know, they just, they aren't willing to put in the time or the effort or whatever to consider different options. Other times, uh, government entities in particular are constrained by forces that they have no control over. <laughs> and so, you know, you can care as much as you want, and yet you cannot act in the way that might be um, at least perceived to be more beneficial. I do think though, I, I've not, I'm, I'm just thinking of, of interactions because I, I go to council meetings and I sit in and listen to public comment on things and I go to other things uh, you know, often. Um, I've not had interactions where I feel that folks are um, ignorant um, or dismissive 
I, I have been present when I feel like, oh, come on, can I think there's something that you've got to be able to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I, but I haven't experienced what I would say is really a, I, and I guess dismissive is kind of the, the best word, you know, or the blinders, like, I don't, I don't even want to deal with you anymore. Although, you know, that happens. That, you know, the squeaky wheel doesn't always get the grease. Mm-hmm. The squeaky wheel sometimes is um, ignored or turned away from. But I think, and, and you know what, it goes beyond the, it goes beyond the leaders. It goes into our neighborhoods. You know, it goes into it goes into the community when, you know, there's there's the big whatever about safe parking lots in churches, you know, in 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 lots to be able to people could spend a night in the in their car in that parking lot and be okay. Um, it goes when there's the argument or discussions around whether tiny house stuff is going to go in, or whether the affordable, you know, what kind of parameters do we put around developers? you know, in terms of developing properties and should they be required to do, you know, a certain percentage of affordable um, housing in that unit that they're building? Or do we give them allowance where we don't really want those people or that level of housing in our neighborhood? Let's give them an out and they can build it elsewhere. You know, those things are going on in Bellingham. Like where, how do we, how do we do this? How do we, is it okay to have um, mobile homes, manufactured housing in a neighborhood? That's a current conversation. And what is a mobile home? I think there's a difference for me, there's a difference between mobile home and manufactured housing. Hmm. Mainly because my grandma and grandpa lived in a 10 foot wide mobile home that literally looked like you could have pulled it down the road. Hmm. Whereas a manufactured home often sits on a foundation but in um, zoning stuff, sometimes those are considered the same. I don't, I mean, this, it's more, it's more complicated than just the leaders. The leaders could make great decisions and the neighbors could say, mm, yeah, they could make life miserable. Yeah. You know, so. And many of the most affordable entry level homes in Bellingham or in Whatcom County are actually manufactured homes, Correct. which might disqualify you from a loan. You might not be Correct. able to sell that home. You know, those are, there's so many barriers that they, mm-hmm. that, you know, a, a manufactured home is a really, you know, like you're saying a positive, quick, short-term way mm-hmm. <laughs> that then even mm-hmm. if it happens, there are still barriers to people even right. in the future that, yeah, is really kind of hard to yeah. be added to these conversations. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, you know, a year ago, I couldn't have said anything of what I just said. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't take much to learn a little. Um, and I would say I was, you know, I didn't take the time to learn stuff before I was in the position where I needed to. Um, and that's on me. Then would you say there is a place for more voices at like the Bellingham City Council or Ferndale or that would be able to advocate for people, would you say that there is enough, there are enough voices or are there more needed? I would say there are more needed. And even if it's just voices of curiosity. Mm. To, Can you say more do, about that? Well, I think even for myself coming into a role where I didn't know anything, I asked questions differently than somebody who already knew what was going on. Mm. And so sometimes I think we, we think we need to be directly involved or it has to impact us in some way in order to um, speak to a matter. And maybe, maybe it, it could be beneficial to have just that wondering, that curiosity. Um, and then if I'm on the call, you know, I might be like, oh my God, the public comments going on so long. <laughs> but I, but I think it's helpful. And as we were talking earlier, I thought, you know, when I don't know if this exists actually, so maybe it already exists. You know, for the el- for elders, they have in every nursing home their senior living place. You know, they have all over the place the ombudsman, the senior ombudsman. There's a state office where you can get support, or they'll accompany you in dealing with concerns or issues. That's what we need. We need we need homeless ombudsmen. Mm. You know. Um, that it can walk with you and navigate, which case management does to a certain degree. But it feels like 
you know, maybe a little bit less, um, less structured, but still, so that mentoring piece even, you know, we're talking about on the other side, but an early mentoring, you know, that, that early spot of mentoring to say, you know what, I'll, I'll accompany you on this. Um, I'll help you ask the right questions. Um, maybe that's it. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and participating with the Interfaith Coalition, um, Echoes has been uh, kind of a, a member church of the coalition itself. Mm -hmm. Our, our um, uh, participation has been a little bit uh, limited to uh, donating some items for the annual auction. Uh, it's been actually mm -hmm. kind of cool outdoor themed. We've, we've enjoyed putting some things together nice. for that. What, what can people do? Are there ways for individuals uh, to participate uh, and contribute to the Interfaith Coalition in addition to donations? And which, by the way, I should say donations here. Yes, it is possible to donate. And that it link is, is in the chat box on both YouTube and Facebook. So, yeah, it is possible. Um, and right now we're scheduled to do an in-person event on March 26th, 2022. Um, and an auction. It'll look a little different, but that's that's our intent. Um, I think one of the things we're working on right now is a way that we are able to engage volunteers, um, folks that want to be involved in different ways. And so we have we have things we have non housing programs that are always available. Um, Kids need books is a book donation. Um, thing that has given over 100,000 books to kids and their families throughout the county. Um, winter warmth is the coat drive, which is getting underway. And we need volunteers for that. We actually need a coordinator for winter warmth, the coat drive. That's open to the entire county. Um, so that's a big old deal. Thousands of coats of all sizes are collected and put away or given away. And we partnered with Ridwell, New to Bellingham. Really? And Seriously. we're, we're going to be Ridwell's, yeah, we're going to be Ridwell's special collection beginning October 18th through like November 1st. They're going to collect coats on our behalf and they know our parameters and then they'll do an initial sort and then we'll, to make sure that meets what we need, which basically is clean and that sort of thing. And they won't give us anything that doesn't meet that parameter, but yeah, Ridwell. Um, so that's pretty cool. Wow. Um, and we for those who haven't heard, Ridwell is oh. a new organization in Bellingham, but it exists in some other metropolitan areas that will recycle things that you can't recycle through the city. Um, so really kind of cool, but it's like a, a, a monthly fee and they'll come in and collect your stuff. And it's pretty extraordinary. All the things that they can that they can uh, recycle or repurpose in some way. Um, so that's yep. amazing. They're brand new here and you're already working with them. That's so cool. I know. Um, very exciting. So Coat Drive, if you want to coordinate it, mm, we can give you all sorts of um, information and support. Uh, Holiday Joy, just had a meeting about that today. So last year we we provided, we work with Opportunity Council on this and identifying households. And it was pretty close to 100 households last year that the community, the Bellingham community, um, provided um, holiday gifts for wow. um, those households. So that's an opportunity um, as we figure out how we're going to distribute and all of that. So there's all sorts of places there. Those are non-housing programs. Within housing, we're working on expanding our literacy program. And so we're going to be working with Whatcom Dream to train volunteers to actually teach the courses and or um, accompany families because we ask our families to participate. So you would be a mentor with a family. So like do the class with them or you would have already taken the class and then um, be able to support the family as they're working on those financial goals. Uh, so that's a piece. Uh, we do we do meal kits for everybody's in their own apartments now. That's not this rotational model. So they have their own kitchens and laundries and things like that. And But twice a week, um, we offer deliveries of meal kits to prepare um, two or three days worth of food and families get to choose recipes and things like that. And you can do extra things within those boxes. A lot of congregations do those and 
they'll choose to do a birthday box if they find out the family has a birthday coming up and um, do extra things around holidays like Mother's Day and Fourth of July and things like that. Um, I have to think our tutoring <laughs> our tutoring program is also um, expanding where we want to offer enrichment courses for uh, for kids and particularly teenagers um, if they want to learn how to play the guitar or play the piano or an art class or a craft thing um, for adults as well. Um, also, also folks that um, we've got one of our tutors who is doing English as a second language. She's done that for a variety of years. And because the Whatcom Community College and other venues aren't open, she's um, doing her ESL um, teaching um, through, through us, through our location. So that sort of support um, accompaniment with families is also something we're working on strongly. We also have had, through the pandemic, we had volunteers doing reading books to kids, but then they could, they're on our YouTube channel. You can see some of our volunteers reading books. They did dance parties, um, Zoom dance parties with, with kids and families. And you can cool. easily, um, we do volunteer training and you can access that information on our website and, you know, kind of complete that and get more questions answered. And, and there's things that aren't involved. We have volunteers who help with our mailing list, you know, with our newsletter. Um, you know, there's, there's ways of serving, even if maybe you're not comfortable engaging face to face at this time, um, you can engage. There's other opportunities as well. That's um, really actually quite a lot. Um, it, it can can people find out that information on your website? Yep, some of it, or, or they can they can easily access to ask ask us. We okay. need yard people, you know, that want to work on flower beds. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, because have knowing ways to be able to plug in would be, you know, pr pretty great. Mm -hmm. Um, particularly as individuals, you don't necessarily have to be connected to a faith community. Right. And, uh, exactly. And they can be like, I want to be involved in this program. So awesome. Mm -hmm. So again, and donations. If you've got, yeah. Yeah, I'm just gonna say if you have a particular interest or skill to say, you know what, I'm really good at this, or this is my work, and I think maybe I'd love to offer this. And yeah. you know what? My guess is we could find a spot. Okay, cool. So. That's awesome. If if there's any last questions, feel free to put them in the comments or the chat box. Um, I just want to say that uh, we're incredibly thankful um, to you, Deanna, for joining us tonight and uh, for being in Bellingham. It's cool to have you here. I mean, <laughs> having gone to school here a few years ago and then coming back um, and offering this community uh, your expertise and your heart and your compassion and uh, your um, kind of get her done -ness, um, is uh, is a valuable thing. So thank you for being with us tonight and for being who you are here in Bellingham and uh, heading up this really important interfaith uh, coalition. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a, a link in there about volunteer information uh, if you want to know for the interfaith coalition. And just a, a kind of a little preview uh, next month. Uh, Hampshire Church is going to be on Monday, September 20th, and our guest is going to be our region's Lutheran bishop, who Yay. Deanna also knows. <laughs> so, and, what is and, it? Or if you don't know who she is, you can also know her as Rick Steve's uh, girlfriend. So, that's yeah, fun too. That's true <laughs> as well. Yeah. Who so, just and, visited and, Bellingham? So, if, if, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and about five or six or seven people yesterday when I was, I was a guest preacher at Crisis Servant. Um, thought I was the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a little. Our awkward. hair is <laughs> and, well. Our hair is similar, and we're both women. I think that was kind of the, the deal. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! And you were a special speaker, so yeah. I was special speaker. Yep. <laughs> Great. Okay. Cool. We have another comment uh, in that some folks are checking out the volunteer program. So oh, that is boy. lovely. And so just so everyone knows, uh, Echoes meets most Monday nights at 630. Sometimes we are outdoors. And so when uh, sun starts going down earlier, we are often not meeting outdoors for or sorry, meeting on Monday nights for Wild Church. I got Wild Church right here, right now. 
Um, and uh, so, yeah, you can check out our website, echoesbellingham.org, to see what we're up to. Uh, we love to um, integrate new folks and folks who are particularly are looking for a spiritual uh, faith-based community, and they haven't been able to find one. And sometimes that includes people who've been kicked out of traditional church. So there's a lot of us who uh, have kind of been given the door, and uh, we are ticked at quite often a safe place for those folks, too. <laughs> so... We, we, we need to be around. Um, so let's see. Uh, any other questions? I think we're going to close it up. And I just want to offer um, a blessing uh, to you, Deanna, uh, for the work that you do. Uh, we do pray that uh, God uh, moves with you and that the work that you're able to do through the Interfaith Coalition um, has got the stamp of Jesus all over it. Um, and we are grateful for um, you and all those who work with you, because we know it's not just you. We know it is a big team. Uh, so all of those who work with you, we, we ask for uh, encouragement and um, tenacity and the ability to um, be resourced while you are resourcing others. Um, and we also pray for goodness to come to those who are being housed uh, through your organization. So blessing be upon them as well. And for all those who will be coming through your doors, um, particularly during these incredibly, increasingly challenging times of COVID. So may you be Thank blessed you. and may you continue to be a blessing to others. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. And, and uh, Thanks, so, Emma. yeah, we know the future Hamster Church is coming up next month. Uh, Emma, do you want to give a little kind of background on kind of what we're going to be doing coming up soon on e with Echoes? Uh, we're doing service church on Friday with uh, Field Fridays with... Wacom Land Trust. Thank you, Wacom Land Trust. Yep. Uh, and so there's a, it's like nine to three, but even if you want to give a few hours um, or just an hour or two or just help, uh, help in your own backyard, we would love that. Uh, and then we're taking Labor Day Monday off and then we'll meet for Pub Church uh, at uh, Colshan Trackside, uh, so family friendly, uh, dog friendly. I, you could try to bring your cat there if you were feeling brave, um, but it's bike friendly also too, um, but just a, a place to have kind of real conversations um, that sometimes we're not able to have other places. So uh, we're excited that we get to be outdoors for a little bit longer and, and get to meet safely, uh, as safely as we can right now. Um, and we're just grateful to be a partner to other organizations that are doing cool things here in Bellingham with us. So we hope you'll join us. Amen. So thank you. And uh, we will hopefully see other people um, later and maybe even you, Deanna. So thank you guys. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. And we're going to be winding up and uh, we'll hopefully see you again. And if you, again, if you need any questions uh, answered from uh, the Interfaith Coalition, feel free to find them on their website. Uh, donations are always welcome. And you can find us on echoesbillingham.org as well. So good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night.